Business with the Natural Resources Conservation Service and uh, the Agribiz Expo wanted to highlight um, Soil Health as one of the workshops here. And 2015 happens to be the International Year of Soils. And so there's a worldwide focus on soils and sustainability. And obviously that is the backbone of our crop production, whether it's cattle or row crop or whatever form of agriculture that you're in is, is soils. And, and are we treating the soils in a, in a manner that we'll be able to still produce crops in the next 20 to 50 years? Or is this an, an area that we need to look at that the soils are resource, number one resource is degrading. So um, we have asked Dr. Buzz Clute to share with you um, some benefits of improving soil health. And Dr. Clute, I've gotten to know over the last three to four years. Buzz. 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 And it's one Z, not two, if you're trying to write down his name. But he has been instrumental with, uh, he has done several video series called the um, Science of Soil Health, and then also... Undercover Farmers. There's another um, one that you may want to Google called Undercover Farmers, and it's a story about some farmers in North Carolina that are using cover crops to improve their soils on their farm. Um, and so... With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Clute. He actually is a um, works at our I attended Clemson University, but so he is a University of South Carolina um, associate professor over there. So if you got any Gamecocks in the room, this is your opportunity to shine. But, um, we've been working with with Dr. Clute very closely over the last three or four years on soil biology and soil improvement um, with. NRCS, uh, Clemson Extension. We've had some conservation and innovation grants through Clemson and with uh, the Conservation District and also my wife tells me I need this microphone, sorry. Um, so we've been doing some, some agreements with uh, Clemson Extension, the Conservation Districts and also um, University of South Carolina with Dr. Clute on, on looking at different farms around the state and how we can improve um, different aspects of soil health. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Clute and um, we'll be back on after the session. Sounds good. <clears throat> can everybody hear me if I talk like this? Apart from my accent, you're good? Okay, because I have to talk with my hands. All right. I'm, I'm going to admit to you a, a couple of things, and the first thing is uh, when Hannah asked me to talk, um, I said yes, but I'll tell you that I've been quite apprehensive and somewhat intimidated uh, by talking up here. You know, I have the picture of Clemson farmers, guys, you know, in, in, in orange Clemson hats, taking my advice, and then, you know, at the end of the year, come harvest time when, when their crops fail, you know, they're all with torches around my house. And fortunately, uh, <laughs> fortunately, my, my friends Carl and Alan and John, and uh, I think that's the three of you guys, uh, they haven't done that yet. So maybe I've done one or two uh, good things. But I, I have to admit to you that I'm, I, was, I am a little bit apprehensive when I speak about this. Um, it's not my intention to divide, but my intention to unite. And really, today what I want to do is <clears throat> um, show you a couple of things and tell you a story rather than try and take facts and put them in your head. And, and the first thing I want to tell you is, or show you, is um, uh, I, I went out into the garden. I'm a really bad gardener. I know a little bit about soils. I know very little about vegetables. But about um, four years ago, um, I went to an abandoned lot uh, two doors down from my house and I started a garden there. And um, I've divided the garden up into what it was originally, which is basically um, a monoculture lawn which gets mowed down to one inch and it's never allowed to grow much uh, higher than one inch. The second part was a, an organic garden where I compost. But the third part is a, a part of the garden that I just put into cover crops. I didn't grow anything in the first season. Put it into cover crops and for the last four years cover cropped it. Uh, I grow vegetables in the summer and basically take as many seeds of as many varieties in the fall and I, I, and I throw them out there. So oats 
uh, rye, um, uh, radishes, uh, clovers, vetches, and I throw it out there. Um, and, and this is the result. So I don't know if you would be able to tell me which one might have been cover cropped and which one not. Okay, so this was the original soil over here. Um, can we do something unconventional? Why don't you all get up and, and, and come a little bit closer? Take a look. Pass it around. So, yeah, pass it, pass it around. But, um, <laughs> so have a look at that. Sorry, I do this with my class. So that, that's my garden, and it took four years for that to happen. Um, there's another one I'm going to pass around. Is um, Well, let's do this one. It's a little bit bigger. It's kind of heavy. Um, and uh, if you could you go to uh, go back to the light for a second? I just wanted to show. Go to stage three, please. All right, stage three. This morning I went out to my buddy Jason Carter's farm. This is Jason. And this is his land over here. He's got a multi-species cover crop. And this is his neighbor's land, which is essentially fallow. It, it had wheat planted in it, but the wheat has uh, failed, it looks like. But essentially it was fallow. And I want you to have a look and tell me over here which of those soils you would rather farm in. You know, is there, is there something different about it? Um, and, and the reason why I wanted to, uh, let's pass these around. It's the same, it's just a little bit shallower. So, yeah, okay, you want to pass so that? Thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah. And, and the reason why I wanted to, to talk to you or to show you this is that, uh, okay, these soils were all taken, those two were taken within about 30 yards of one another. And the orange and black soil that from my garden were taken about um, less than 10 yards from one another. And the reason why I want to tell you uh, or, or show you that is, is, is first of all to make you, um, make you see or, or to, to provide a little bit of evidence that soils can change under management and they can change very rapidly. Soils... Uh, are a lot more dynamic in their properties, things like organic matter, things like color, than we uh, had originally suspected. And so if, if, if we can start the conversation and, 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 and talk about soils understanding that their properties are largely dynamic rather than static. The other thing I'd like you to consider, at least while we talk, is that soils are living uh, rather than inert. We, we often hear, I think some people have gone to college and heard that the definition of a soil is a medium to grow plants. And, and I would put forward to, today to you that soil is a living ecosystem. Um, and, uh, you know, plants and animals are part of that living ecosystem. So let's look at that. Um, I'm going to tell a story about uh, my project that started about um, in November last year. And we've got a few results. Uh, I think it was fairly bold. I was warned that I, I shouldn't overreach uh, uh, on this one. And so we, we've got some results um, related to that. Thanks very much. All right. And feel free afterwards to come up and uh, to talk to me about the soils. Well, before we carry on, are there any questions about these soils that I've just shown? You may have said it, but can you clarify the soil type? Yes, this is an Orangeburg loamy sand right, or sand right here. Yes, sir. Did you amend the soils at all with like a uh, pH buffer or lime or anything like that, gypsum or anything like that? I don't know the exact soil, uh, the exact field history. The only difference, the, the significant difference between these two is the one on this side has been cover cropped for now the, the fourth year. Or this is, I think, the fourth year in cover cropping. So I think they've done amendments, but this guy is, he's, he's liming, he, he is cutting back and cutting back because his pHs aren't dropping as much anymore. So, so but. Man, Thank you, Gordon. Turbo-filled several times, so it's had more disturbance than you would on the left. The left 
left side is a wheat, bean, and I believe peanuts. peanuts. Yeah, yeah. The one on the right would be a corn soybean rotation. And that's the history of those farms. They haven't had any major amendments as far as gypsum or any compost uh, or anything like that. The, and manure is a backbone of one of the nutrient inputs with the farm on the right with the cover on it. The darker soils have a history of, of manure application on those farms. Dairy? Uh, poultry litter. Poultry litter. Okay. Yeah, and, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Thanks, Gordon. Um, my intention is to try and speak for only half an hour and then have time for questions. But if you do have a question, you know, um, and it's salient to what we've got going, then uh, feel free to put up your hand and we'll go from there. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go. Let's talk about this whole soil health phenomenon. Um, first of all, one of the reasons why I'm apprehensive about talking is because it's contentious. And our intention is, or my intention is not to sow contention, but to try and find ways of, of, of uh, everybody kind of trying to have a similar view of the soil. Um, the other thing about soil health is it's really, really difficult to define. You know, what is soil health? How do you define it? You know, um, it's like, you know, uh, asking someone, what, how would you describe a beautiful sunset? Everybody has a slightly different view of that. So that's, that's difficult. And then for farmers, there's a whole level, whole new level of management. Uh, Carl Coleman and I were talking the other day. Um, and, you know, he said the whole, you know, adding cover crops on top of everything else adds a whole new level of management. And there's always anxiety, especially you've planted something in the ground. Is it going to come up? Is it going to come up? Oh my goodness, it's four days and I ain't seen nothing yet. Okay, so that's part of that. There's this whole management thing, you know, when we do cover crops, when do I plant them? What do I plant? When do I terminate them? Do I plant? Do I, do I roll them? Do I plant into them standing? So there, there's this whole additional layer of management and that's tough. And then of course, we've got the la label of being unscientific which I think I'm beginning to revel in, um, and we can talk about that, but, um, uh, and I can give you the references right now, but I do want to say that there is a, uh, in the Liebig era, Liebig, uh, Justice von Liebig, and guys like Mitzelich, and the guys from the Rothamsted uh, Research Facility in England, developed what is known as the mineral theory of soils. What I want to tell you is that prior even to the 20th century in the late 1800s, a parallel um, uh, discipline of soil studies that looked uh, more at soil carbon and soil nitrogen developed um, uh, as well. So it was a par parallel and complementary discipline and, and it's a very well uh, developed discipline. So yes, uh, you can say we're, uh, uh, you, you can label us unscientific, but I'd like you to put the label away because when we label something, we immediately take debate out of that process. So um, it, I, I understand, uh, but I'm hoping that I can show you a little bit of the science behind what we do. The other thing is apparently we're subversive. So I like that term, you know, being subversive, but let, let's have a look and see what it is. But at the end of the day, this thing is about the farmer. And what we, can, what we see in South Carolina happening is a mirror image of what's happening all across the country is that this thing's not being driven by universities. It's not being driven by extensions. It's not being driven by industry. It's being driven by farmers. Farmers are saying, hey, there's something going on here. We, we don't quite know what it is, but, but we're going to try. And scientists like me, if you can call me a scientist, are scrambling to try and figure out what's going on because they're doing things and, and we're coming in behind them and saying, okay, well, we think this is what's going on. This is what may be going on. And so as a scientist, if there's anything I've learned is how little I really know. Uh, but it's really exciting uh, and we'll, we'll talk about it. So this is, this is the soil health 
idea, this idea of soil health. I had a fascinating, uh, about a year ago, I, uh, I met with Dr. Dwayne Beck from the Dakota Lakes Research Institute. Go to www.dakotalakes.com and have a look at their website. Um, they've been going for over 30 years. And Dr. Dwayne Beck, this is an alternative definition, or not necessarily a, a definition, but an alternative approach. Dr. Dweck talk, Beck talks about a systems approach. Um, basically, you're looking at your whole field or your whole farm as an ecosystem. It's a system where you want to imitate natural systems as closely as possible. He's got the prairie out there, okay? And so how do I imitate natural systems there? Um, and what he does, in, instead of saying, you know, you've, your soil has to have a pH of that or it's got to have this color or that color. He looks at outcomes and you can see some of these outcomes here. Healthy food, clean water, living soils, abundant wildlife. Um, above all, what he talks about is farmers have to make a living, make a profit before those things come out. But for us, we've got to ask ourselves the question in terms of outcomes of our soils. Are we making water go into the ground? And if you looked at your farms, uh, or your fields in the last few days, did you have standing water or did that water go into the ground? Um, Carl had someone who, uh, who is working with him on one of his field. Carl does a little bit of disking for some experimental uh, seed that he's doing. And the guy came back to him and said, Mr. Carl, you know where you dissed, the water's still standing. Where you've got that cover crop on and you no-tilled, there's no water on the, on, on, on the surface of that soil. So the question is, am I making water go into the ground? Because that water is going to be used for my crop next year. Uh, these guys are absolute past masters at it. They're making 120 to 135 bushel, per, bushel of corn for, uh, with something like 11 inches of rain a year. Hey, Sonny. Hey, Bert. How are you doing, man? Good to see you. I'm saying that because I'm going to make fun of you later on. Okay. Right. So the outcome is, am I making water go into the ground? Am I recycling my nutrients or am I leaking my nutrients? How do I know whether my nutrients are leaking? It's when my pHs go down. All right? So that's basically the sure sign we won't get into that. But there are ways that we can recycle those nutrients and not, not let them leak out of the system. Um, do I have living soils? You know, living soils is one of the things Duane talks about all the time. Uh, in the series, The Science of Soil Health, uh, Duane Beck will be speaking, will release this video uh, in February. Hey, Dave. You're late. I'm late. <laughs> all right. So that's, that's I'm sorry, Dave. Um, so that's... That's what uh, Dwayne talks about, but he says you've got tools, and the tools you have, the tools you have are technology. So you've got precision ag, you've got herbicides, you've got pesticides, you've got, uh, you've got your, your fertilizers, you've got no-till, um, you've got uh, um, cover crops, you, you, you may even have perennials. He grows corn in standing alfalfa every year, okay? Uh, so, those are all the tools. You don't have to use every one of those tools. You don't, you don't always have to use that tool every time, each time. But those are your tools to achieve these outcomes. So, I like Jay, uh, his systems approach. I like the idea of biomimicry. Um, we, we look at this, um, corn, cotton, and soybeans. I don't think I need to tell you what's happened to those prices. This is the price of crude. Now we've got a really nice, you know, the crude's looking pretty good right now. But I don't think anyone's planning their strategy on crude being at sort of below $50 a barrel for, for any time soon. So we've got the situation where we've got low commodity prices, um, are probably rising energy prices in any case. So what, what are we going to do? Because we need to get all these inputs to make crops grow. Um, there's something called the fertilizer nitrogen use efficiency. Um, basically, it's how much nitrogen actually ends up in my crop. And the fertilizer nitrogen usage efficiency in grains globally 
is about 33%, 33 to 36%. That means 75% of the nitrogen that is applied through fertilizer doesn't go into the grain. It's gone. Okay? It's leaked out of the system. Um, I've got, I'd be happy to share with you some of the, the references on that one. Um, um, the phosphorus use efficiency is about 50%. In other words, 50% of the phosphorus we apply actually goes into the crop. And who knows where the other stuff goes. And, and the question I would ask is, um, uh, what we also see is with the increasing use of nitrogen fertilizer, the fertilizer usage efficiency is actually going down and not increasing. And we have to ask, what other industry is going to accept those losses? I think we sometimes accept them because experts tell them that, that that's the way it's supposed to be. But I see here a huge opportunity for gain to produce two and three dollar corn. Um, that's my opinion. And I, I know Alan told me that, you know, if he plants cotton this year at those prices, you're not going to make a profit, right? So what are we going to do? I, I guess Dr. Phil is saying, well, should we be throwing more inputs or is there some way of getting around that? You know, I love Dr. And how's that working for you, right? Okay, so how is that working for you? I think it's a concern for anyone who's making a living out of this. Now, when we talk about biomimicry, you'll see it in every aspect of our lives, in, in, in architecture, you know, auto industry. This is my favorite. Michael Feltz has a, had a shark skin suit that, you know, reduced the drag, and, and they got that from shark, shark skin. Why would biomimicry be such a bad thing in agriculture? Why not agriculture? We do it in cars, we do it in sports. Why not agriculture? So we're mimicking natural systems um, and, and we, can talk, uh, we can talk about that later. I wanted, I wanted to sort of jump to part of our story now. This is the Carter Farms. This is a clover and vetch cover crop. I uh, took this picture on April the 4th. Um, the actual biomass on this cover crop, it, it was about that deep, so knee deep. I measured 10,000 pounds per acre dry basis. It was about 33,000 pounds wet basis. Um, I calculated if we assumed that we had 4% nitrogen in that, I calculated that Jason had 400 pounds per acre of nitrogen over here. So he had really a lot of biomass. 41 days later, this is Jason's farm. This hasn't come out as clearly as I wanted to, but we could see very, very little biomass, uh, very, very little of what was in that cover crop. All right, it had all been consumed by the soil. The soil, you can almost say, is like the, the stomach of a cow, the rumen of a cow. It's being consumed, okay? Now, I want you to have a look. Jason inadvertently gave me a side-by-side -side comparison of what a cover crop is uh, uh, of cover crop versus no cover crop. And if you look here very carefully, there's a little line of yellowed corn. All right, and you, if you look again closely over here, and I can show you later, is that his residue, the corn stubble over here, there was much more corn stubble in this line of yellowed, uh, of, of yellowed corn uh, than before. And what had happened was his GPS was slightly off. He was planting his covers this way and he had a little skip over here. So he skipped about two to three foot and this is the result. So if you want a side-by-side -side visual measurement of what co his cover crop did for him last year, uh, th that's a really good example. And again, you know, these are side-by-side -side examples over here. So that was kind of cool. These guys have living soils. Both of these soils, uh, this is a Norfolk loamy sand, and this is an Orangeburg loamy sand. So these are loamy sands. Um, this is a, a sun hemp nodule over here. This nodule is the size, I believe, of a dime. Was it a dime or was it a quarter, Carl? A penny? Penny dime. Come on, you guys. <laughs> Stephen was sent here to heckle me. So. <laughs> All right. So, you know, 
living soil. How about this? This is a loamy sand. This is sand where you can see that the soils on the surface have begun to aggregate. aggregate. And again, this is an Orangeburg. I took that picture on Carl Coleman's field. Um, so that's, that's a big deal. I want to talk about the five crazy cats. What did I call them? Crazy coastal plant cats. I wonder if the, the, the co coastal plant cats can just stand up for a second. Sunny, come on. Come on, you guys. Because you guys are crazy. Come on. All right. Uh, okay, there they are. Uh, <coughs> it's Alan Gaddy, Sunny Price, John McInnes. Cole Coleman, and I don't think Jason's over here, Jason Carter. Jason farms in Eastover. The other guys are in Dillon and Clio. I think they're crazy because they decided to enter into an agreement with a city boy from Africa. My, my accent's from Namibia. We don't, Namibia gets less than 12 inches of rain a year. What do we know from row crops, right? And so the crazy guys got together with the city boy from Africa who comes from that law university in the middle of the, of, the, of the state. I mean, how crazy is that, John? You're nuts. So you must have been desperate. And so we want to tell these desperate... <laughs> right? You, kind of, you, you guys are sort of desperate there, aren't they? Okay, sorry. I, I, I did want to make a little bit of fun of them. But yeah, you know, it's kind of crazy. But uh, these guys were kind enough to, to humor me and to work with me a little bit. And we engaged in a um, conservation innovation grant. The basic idea being, oh, so that was the grant here, using CO2 burst tests to measure on-farm plant available nitrogen from cover cropped soils in South Carolina. That's kind of a mouthful. But the basic idea was that we were going to get these guys who had already started, they had the expertise in cover crops, use cover crops to build uh, organic matter, and part of that organic matter, part of that organic basis, uh, structurally is going to be organic nitrogen. Use a new method to es estimate the mineralizable nitrogen from soil respiration. So by measuring soil respiration, we can understand how much of that organic nitrogen is going to become available to the plant. And then do side-by-side -side tests on the farm. So, you know, these guys have been fabulous in working with me, even when we didn't know that it was going to work. So the basic science behind this is that soil organic matter, if you look at soil organic matter, about 1% of organic, if we have 1% of organic matter in the soil, and that's, kind of typical in the coastal plain, it's a little bit less, it's 20,000 pounds per acre of organic matter, okay? About 60% of that organic matter is made up of carbon. Where's carbon come from? Carbon comes from plants. Plants are the only ones that can get carbon through photosynthesis, and that ends up in the soil. About 1,200, sort of a 10 to 1 ratio is typical of this 1,200 pounds per acre, folks, for every 1% is organic nitrogen. And what happens, what we know is from about 2% to 5% of this decomposes every year. It doesn't spontaneously decompose. That's what I believed as a chemical engineer. I thought, you know, it just kind of happened. It happens because of soil microbes, not just bacteria, but fungi and all sorts of things that munch on the stuff. And uh, we, we would, uh, the, the stuff that is being converted or being decomposed is what we would call microbially active carbon. And what happens is it turns, when they decompose that, it turns into carbon dioxide. But these guys, when they metabolize and they go through their life cycles, some of it is excreted as, with, as um, substances like ammonium. And that then is the process of mineralization, which then goes to feed the plants. What did the plants bring to the party? Well, plants bring carbon to the party. They take carbon dioxide, um, they fix that carbon dioxide, and they leak between 5 and 20% of their total energy that they used in photosynthesis, and they leak that back into the soils. Why do they do that? Because they want to recruit microbes. Plants are not in, uh, um, deaf, dumb, you know, Tommy, Tommy, deaf, dumb, blind kids. They're not deaf, dumb, blind actors. They are 
basically the cheerleaders in the soil, whether it's a cover crop or whether it's a cash crop, it's a cheerleader, it's recruiting these microbes. The microbes perform certain services and then the plant brings them carbon. Carbon being the energy currency of the soil. I, I digress. Okay, so the idea here was, you know, uh, mineralizable nitrogen uh, for about 2% decomposition per year would be about 24 pounds of nitrogen per acre, which is, uh, you know, it's not much. But what if we can increase to about 2% organic matter you know what would that look like so the idea was let's increase our organic matter let's try and measure that through soil respiration and see what happens um, this whole idea of measuring carbon dioxide has become cheaper and cheaper over the last hundred years so we can measure co2 and there's a guy called rick haney alan franz Lobos, and um, another guy called will brinton they, uh, they, they noticed that um, one day carbon dioxide soil respiration is actually very, very well correlated to 28-day nitrogen mineralization rates. In other words, the higher your CO2 titration or the higher your CO2 measurements, the more your soil breathes, the more nitrogen you're going to find in the soil. And that's because carbon and nitrogen are structurally related in these organic molecules. These organic molecules get cleaved, carbon dioxide goes up, nitrogen then gets nitrogen and other organic molecules then get made available to the plants. So that was wonderful and uh, it was a really easy system for me uh, to use. Uh, I, I get labs to do it though because I'm, I'm not a great lab rat so we've had some good cooperation from Rick Haney. But in the spring of 2004, these five crazy cats gave me about uh, 10 acres each, and, um, or at least the fall of 2013. Uh, th uh, they gave me 10 acres each. They planted their own cover crops, essentially multi-species cover crops. So this is uh, six months later. This is Alan's land, uh, Carl, Jason's land, uh, Jason in Sunny's land. And then this is John's land over here. Uh, our, the biomass that we measured, this is dry biomass. Alan didn't really get a good stand. So um, that was kind of disappointing, but you know, it happens from time to time. But uh, Alan's going to have a great stand this year. So, but the biomasses that we had, this is dry basis. Um, and I think they grew even further, even more from here, 9,500, 10,000. All right, take 10, let's take 10,000 pounds per acre and let's say conservatively that 10, 000, th this cover crop has about 2% nitrogen. 10,000 pounds per acre at 2% 2, 2 nitrogen. How much nitrogen is that? Two, 200 pounds of nitrogen, right, per acre. Um, and what we found... These fields over here are actually Austrian winter peas. So, you know, you could probably be very conservative by saying two pounds, but I told Alan, I, I told John and Sonny that I thought they had probably 4% of nitrogen in them. So you're looking at a heck of a lot of nitrogen above ground. And so um, what we did at the beginning of the season, at, in the beginning of the growing season, we measured the we estimated how much organic nitrogen was in the soil, how much nitrogen we thought would be made available to the crop. Um, and what you can see is Carl and Jason's fields, we figured about 40, you know, it's not precise. And in Alan, John and Sonny's fields, it was about 25. Um, this is the, these are the crops these guys grew over here. Obviously, soybeans, we had no, you know, Jason wasn't putting anything out uh, on his soybeans. Um, but on Carl's, we said, okay, instead of putting 120 pounds an acre out, put 65 pounds. So that's minus 55. Alan put out minus 25 pounds. So that was equivalent to what we thought was in the soil. John, uh, he, John went kind of wild. This was sort of a, 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 a collaborative process. And John says, well, you know, let me try less than half. So for his Milo, he, he put on 40 pounds per acre. Sonny put um, 
55 pounds down for his cotton, but he also did a little check strip in the middle of his field where he put zero pounds of um, uh, nitrogen down. So that was it. Um, the original idea was only to look at, at the soil samples, but it's really, really hard once we started measuring the biomass. I mean, look at these amounts of nitrogen, guys. Okay, so it's like, wow, what do we do with that? Because, you know, when's it going to mineralize? When's it going to become, is it going to take one year, three years, five years? Well, with Jason, we found it was going to take about five weeks, and it's like, where is it? So this was kind of something that, you know, came up, and it's like, wow, what do we do with this? But in terms of some of these decisions, like over here and over here, we said, well, let's give some credit to that cover crop. And so um, the season went on, and uh, the yield results at the end of the season, I don't know what Carl did, but he said that he had no rain. So there was no rain. He, he, it, it was the, the, the rainfall was pretty bad, and it was pretty much a wash. I don't think we can really make any comparisons. If it ain't going to rain, it ain't going to grow. Jason had beans, well, so we had no basis of comparison. Alan, Alan's corn with standard application of nitrogen, he got 183 versus 126. So that's kind of a bust for us, right? So, um, you know, uh, and I've got a couple of ideas that, that I'd share, um, think about, but compare this to the corn on the next slide uh, from another farm that we had. Um, Sunny's cotton, and I remember going out and sampling, and all of a sudden I see Sunny get out of his truck the day before he just harvested. This was in November, and from his body language, you could see that he was about ready to jump out of his skin. So I trotted back to see what you know, you know, his, you know, he was doing this kind of thing. So I knew he had some yield results, but look at these yield results, guys. On his stand, 90 pounds per acre, he had 1,014 pounds of lint. On his low end, that's 55 pounds, he had 1,143. How, how's that work? But this was the one that probably made Sunny jump up and down over here. So for an extra 86, for an extra 90 pounds of nitrogen, Sunny got 86 pounds of cotton. And it, if you have a look at the economics, that just doesn't work out. So Sunny possibly could have made more money by putting no nitrogen out and just putting his cover crop out there. So that was, and, and I think, Sonny, that was kind of an epiphany for you because you'd been watching this over the time and you'd watched that, that check strip. It was about a foot lower and you were just watching it, but, you know, the development of the bowl and everything looked pretty good, right, even though it was a little bit lower for you. Yeah, yeah. Cutting out a little bit quicker, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then John's Milo that he put in um, came in, he got 134 bushels for the low nitrogen. So he put less than half of the pre pre prescribed nitrogen down and yet got that much in terms of bushels. Now what had happened, obviously, um, I'd started talking to some of the guys uh, on on in the project and, and John kept on calling me and saying, well, what about this and what about that? And he sent me some samples and I tested them and sent them off to a lab as well. But uh, Jason Carter on dryland corn, uh, he grew 175 bushels an acre, 50 pounds an acre of commercial nitrogen. He put about two to two and a half tons. So we estimate that's his manure nitrogen. So his total N was 132 pounds, but he got 175 bushels. His irrigated corn, we estimate, he put 100 pounds through the, uh, uh, 50 pounds at planting and then another 50 pounds in the irrigation system, manure nitrogen, that's what he had and he got his 230 bushels. John, from the four fields that he had, these are his nitrogen applications and yet he made two, bale, two bales of uh, cotton. And John, correct me if I'm wrong, are those historically high yields for you? Yeah. 
Okay, so lower nitrogen, historically high yields. Excuse me, I'm sorry. What's that about, guys? Okay, now you can say, oh, well, you know, it's, it's just a couple of things. And, and I understand, and we will continue to, to get data. But I think these results are momentous. No, it's not a replicated scientific study. But if you want to talk to these five crazy cats, I think they have watched what has happened. And uh, I think they would, they would not say that this is just some anomaly because they've started taking these ideas to the rest of their farms. So w we also had a few soil test surprises. Here, here one of the, you, you know, originally my idea was, you know, we want to build up organic matter in the soil. But we had no idea. Gordon told me from many of the conversations he'd had with researchers and agronomists and everything else, well, that, you know, building soil organic matter in the coastal plain is tough because you've got very coarse soils and you've got very, very wet and hot weather, especially in the summer. Look what happened. This is November 2013. This is November 2014. Look at what, what has happened to every one of these. Um, obviously, this one was a little bit higher than everyone else, and it actually climbed higher. On average, we had 0.4% increase in soil organic matter for all those farm fields. Five fields, we took 13 different composite samples. Each composite sample was by soil series. And, and the thing is, we were told, Gordon, am I right? It cannot be done. You cannot build soil organic matter in the coastal plains. It's impossible. So um, that was something. Here's the other surprise. Our model, the model in our heads is that soil is this inert medium. It's like that barrel, right? And, and, you, and you put your nutrients in, and then you walk away, and then the plant takes the nutrients out, and then you've got to top it up again. Well, after the end, uh, the guys did do fertilization here, but between April and November, there was no fertilization that took place. They took their crops off, and yet, out, on average, the soil test phosphorus stayed the same. It actually came up a little bit. It's not significantly different. But what is that? I mean, Jason, you know, um, and, and I'll show you the next slide. What's, what's with that? I thought that soil phosphorus and soil potassium was supposed to go down when, you, when your crops grew. Are we making, are we manufacturing this stuff? Or are the guys going out and fertilizing when we're not looking? Right? So, in, in, I guess the question, uh, where did I put that? Oh, there we go. Sorry. I guess the question is, oh, sorry, let me go on. Lest we think that these were anomalies, we also discovered on a Carter's farm, the Jason Carter farms, is that um, between November 2013 and 2014, we also saw a 0.4% increase over one year. Okay? Um, and uh, phosphorus went from 100 to 104 to, to 108. And I don't think that is a significant, statistically significant difference. But the point is, he was harvesting, uh, he had soybeans as well, but the point is, he was harvesting 175 bushel of corn. Surely, these things should be going down and not up. Okay, so, you know, how do we explain that? Uh, is it an anomaly? You know, because according to the Liebig model, the mineral model is like it's, it's this barrel that you've got to keep on filling up. Um, so... Surprising yield, res yield results, uh, you know, I wish the yield results for some of these things were better, but they weren't. But we can't look away from that, those cotton and the milo yields and then, um, you know, the corn on Jason Carter's farm. We can't discount those. Um, uh, typo over here. How do we explain 928 pounds of cotton lint with zero pounds of commercial nitrogen? How, how do we explain that? How do we, you know, one of the other things I was up in Pennsylvania, you know, and we were talking about, how do we explain post-harvest cover crops that have anywhere between 200 and 400 pounds of nitrogen in them? I mean, where did that come from? 
it's not all nitrogen fixation because some of these were just brassica cover crops, um, 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 uh, radish cover crops. So can we explain what, what, what happened? And it, it depends. If you view soils as, as inert media that you, you kind of throw your fertilizer in to grow plants, I, I don't think that there's an explanation for what we saw here. If we view soils as living dynamic ecosystems, if we view plants as these cheerleaders that are doing things and changing soil properties as they go along, not only our cash crops, 10 minutes, boy, I've yacked on that much. 15 minutes, okay. All right, well, I'll be done soon. Okay, um, I think we can explain these things if we, th if we see the soil as that living dynamic ecosystem. Um, something, what, what happened was during this process is these crazy five cats started asking me questions like, well, what about my phosphorus and my potassium? And so I said, well, let's go have a look at it because uh, I was out with Dr. Ray Weil from Maryland. And he said, you, you know, you, you've got to look at that whole soil profile. So I went out and uh, looked at these guys, soil test P, and you can see that um, in some cases we were finding very high concentrations, you know, 100 to 150 pounds per acre at 12 inches. Most, you know, my expectation of soil test P would be very high here and then nothing. But we were actually finding a heck of a lot of soil test P down in that soil profile. So if, you're so, if your plant can grow deeper, any, anybody have plants that only go down, their roots only go down six inches? Or do their plants go a little bit, their roots go down a little bit deeper? Well, heck, <laughs> why are we only measuring the top six inches of our soils? What's with that, okay? So, and, and so I'm showing Sonny this and he's going, and next thing I know he's running around sampling his fields again. Okay, um, soil test potassium. Now here's kind of an interesting one. John's field is a, a, mainly a Hornsville. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a fairly light top uh, um, uh, surface soil, uh, at least his A horizon, his, his top soil but then it gets kind of clay pretty quickly. And look at his soil test potassium is pretty low over here, but look at what happens um, here, here, and here. So he's got a heck of a lot more soil test potassium as he goes around, as those clays get hold of that potassium. You can see the other guys have just boatloads of the stuff, okay? So what does that look like? Where did I put my clicker? Ah, there we go. So what does that look like in terms of those top 24 inches? Who knows what it looks like the top 30 or 36 inches? So the phosphorus in pounds per acre, this is how much phosphorus these guys had in the top 24 inches of the soil. This is how much phosphorus is removed with 200 bushel per acre corn. I'm assuming that with the stover it kind of stays there and gets incorporated. Do you, do you think Alan should be, and Alan and Sonny and Carl and Jason, do you think they should be applying phosphorus next year? <laughs> well, maybe that's a loaded question, right? Th th they might have to tell me as well, but I, I personally don't think so. As long as their plants, as long as they can make their plants go down to 24 inches, that's money in the bank for them, as far as I'm concerned. Um, potassium, look at how much potassium every one of them has in the top 24 inches. This is how much my crop removal for 200 bushel per acre corn is, corn grain is. Um, that's a resource, how much? 10 minutes? No, I was oh. going to ask you what extraction that would be. This was uh, everything I've shown you today was from Clemson, the Clemson soil test lab. So it's Malik 1. Extraction, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I've not used any any other uh, any other methods to talk about it. So this is what they had. So could it be that some of those phosphorus and potassium values that we saw was the plants mining those things from down underneath and bringing them up, or maybe even? And I'll show you something else that's really cool. So the other question that arose was. 
does above ground biomass and, and residue count? Or should we wait until we have a complete understanding before we start utilizing these resources? Well, that's a question for the farmer to answer. But 400 pounds per acre? Wow. I mean, you can go out and you can measure that in April or, or late March, and you, you'll, you'll see it there. Um, Carl Coleman uh, sowed a sun hemp buckwheat and uh, sorghum Sudan cover crop post corn so he didn't have to deal with um, his palmer amaranth and morning glory problem and it frost terminated in that early frost that we had well um, he and I have a little project going and I'll talk about that later on but Carl we had about uh, 6,000 to 9,000 9, pounds of residue on the ground, which you say is almost gone now. Okay, six to 9,000 pounds of residue. I sent the, uh, uh, the residue off for tissue sampling at Clemson. It came back between 1.6 and 1.8% nitrogen. So you've got about 80 to 100 pounds of nitrogen on your, on your residue. And as that gets consumed by the soil, Where's it going to go? Into your soil, it's going to be made available to your plants. How quickly, when, where, we don't know yet. But should that stop you from taking advantage of it? Okay, so another question. There are other questions. Can we use cover crops to relieve compaction? When I took these soil samples today in the two fields, there was a distinct difference. Um, if you have a look here, Look at these two jackhammers. Okay, that's the, that's the uh, storage body, but those, um, those tap roots go down eight minutes, go down a huge long way. So can we use it to relieve compaction, suppress weeds? How about controlling bad nematodes? You know, only about less than 10% of our nematodes in the soil are bad. You've got nematodes that eat nematodes, okay? So can we control nematode populations? Can we sta scavenge nutrients and bring them up to the top six inches? Can we make nutrients like P and K, K more plant available? Well, those are questions that we really need to answer. I had the pleasure of spending a lot of or quite a bit of time with Ray Weil. If you know Brady and Weil, the nature and properties of the soil, he was the co-author. He, he works at Maryland. And look at the titles. I'm going to read the titles. Penetration of cover crop roots through compacted soils. Crop cover root channels may alleviate soil compaction effects on soybean crop. Brassica cover crops for nitrogen retention. Forage radish cover crop suppresses winter annual weeds in fall and before corn planting. The mechanism of weed suppression by a forage radish cover crop Brassicaceous and rye, rye cover crops altered free living soil nematode community composition. Nitrogen mineralization from brassicas. And this is my favorite here. Forage radish cover crops increase soil test phosphorus surrounding radish taproot holes. In other words, when we talk about these things, radishes, for instance, don't have mycorrhizal relationships, but they have their own chemicals that they secrete. And remember, before man came along, they had to have these mechanisms to get hold of the nutrients in the soil. Okay, so part of the soil is phosphorus and potassium. Not all of it is plant available, but plants can make it available through these communal rela or, or mutualistic relationships that they have. So that is pretty cool. I mean, our own research, this is coal that he, that he had on his, on his sorghum. And, um, grain sorghum, sun hemp, and buckwheat, that's it, two months of growth. And um, he, I don't know if this is quite apparent to you, but this is the post corn cover, and he said he ran out of seed over here. So we've kind of got a really, uh, basically what's happened over here is his, we've got a lot more hen bit pressure here than here. Was that all um, wheatland now, Carl? No, that, that's peas. Were you oh, that's the peas. Okay, you were just planting the peas. Okay, yeah. So weed suppression. And, and come on, seriously, what chance does a weed have here or here? Right? So weed suppression is, is one of the byproducts that we can bring from, from growing these things, basically keeping a live root, 
keeping the soil covered years, uh, uh, year, uh, years, um, year round. Um, so basically what's happened is this collaboration has just resulted in bunches of questions. Carl and I actually now have two projects. We crowdfunded this one through experiment.com, we surprisingly enough, strangers gave us $5,000. We've got 40 plots where we're looking at nitrogen and regular uh, commercial fertilizer from zero to the full rate for his wheat this year. And then we're also doing an experimental plot, similar thing uh, um, with, with Monty's, uh, Monty's company. And also looking at combinations of fertilizer from the full rate to zero commercial fertilizer. You guys can go and laugh at Carl when he starts harvesting. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm going to just guess here, I'm going to bet that the difference is not going to be as big as we think. So I guess that the bottom line here, and this is what Gordon harps on at me about, is making it pay. I mean, how do we make cover crops pay? And the fact is that this kind of stuff is, there's some subjective stuff. We can't bring it down to an exact science. And what I've seen is a guy is going to look at it and he's going to make a decision, I'm going to go for it. Sonny told me, I've seen the results, I'm buying the extra uh, uh, cover crop seed for that extra 500 acres. I'm going to have to make it pay somehow, I'm going to stop subsoiling, right? So he, that's his 20 to 25 bucks. So in, on Carter Farms, he used uh, his seed and drill cost him about $42 an acre. Right, so that's a negative savings. Um, his fertility, you can see basically uh, what he did, but he used, uh, he used chicken litter on both of them, but um, he cut back a lot on his commercial nitrogen over here. He uses no phosphorus and potassium on his soils anymore. Herbicide, not much of a difference, but he's got no pre-emerge that he uses anymore and he'll be cut it, cutting back on some of his burn down and post-emerge herbicides next year. He didn't use fungicide this year, that's $20 an acre right there. Uh, and he said sometimes he has to use two. So he's just saved that. Machinery, he, he's not subsoiling anymore because he doesn't need to. So that's, uh, you know, over two years, he was subsoiling every two years and he's making one less sprayer trip now because he's planting into green cover. So his net saving is $29 an acre. Um, it's not a huge amount, but he's paying for his cover crop because his vision is there's something else going on here. John McInnes, he's got a net saving of $5 over here, but his biggest uh, saving for his cotton there was uh, his nitrogen fertility. He just went for it. Crazy John, man, you're a crazy guy. All right, Cole Coleman, also a crazy guy. Um, uh, this is wheat, so we don't know. It's to be decided. So Cole probably might end up, you know, you and I might end up the fool anyway. But Cole saved most of his stuff on his fertility. He added a kind of ton of chicken litter, but cut back on it was 145 and 80 of commercial fertility that he'd normally put in there. He, he had to use a manure spreader, so that was machinery that he had to use. So $15. Bottom line is that each one of them has found a way to make it pay. It's, it's not just a loss. So the question is, you know, these crazy cats over here basically says, said, I don't completely understand this but I know I need to make a change, okay? And a change may be hard. You ask these guys, it's been tough. Ask Cole what he felt like uh, during the middle of planting his post corn cover crop. He wanted to quit. Um, but I'm willing to make mistakes, okay? And one of the mistakes might be talking to me on the phone, okay? So I'm willing to make mistakes. Albert Einstein said the definition of insanity is doing something over and ago, over again and expecting a different result. Now these guys are the crazy cats right now, but we have to ask ourselves, who's the crazy cat? I've got two minutes, or this is my last slide. Farmer, you have to ask, how hard is change? I hate change. It's tough, okay? Am I leaving opportunities out there while I wait for absolute certainty? Can I try this on a small scale and not do it on the whole farm? Can I prove clute wrong? 
Maybe that's the way. Will it hurt me to experiment? Do I have a support system? This is really important. These guys, when they get together, it's like brothers, okay? Uh, if you're a provider to the farmer, I want to ask you the question, how hard has changed? It's hard for me. Will the farmer's increased wealth benefit me in the long run? Stephen might be able to speak to that, okay? Um, because Stephen doesn't hate me, and yet he makes his living uh, uh, selling, selling things to farmers. Is this a growth market? Uh, let me rephrase that and say, I wonder if I'd gotten into selling cover crops or started a cover crop business five years ago. How would that have grown? Can I change my business model to tap into new re revenue sources? So what I see over here, folks, when we're looking at soils health, soil health and looking at a systems approach to soils, is I see a win-win-win for everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.